artist, scientist, engineer, inventor, and a man with great concern for the environment and man's relationship to it. Here in his combination studio laboratory, Murray brings his artist's love for beauty to the astounding products and systems he develops. Your sculptures use neon, and um, it baffles me how you take all those colors and then you come out with white light. Um, well, white light is basically made up of uh, all the colors of the rainbow. And uh, if you go back uh, historically in the development of uh, illumination that comes from electrically operated sources such as incandescent, fluorescent, or neon, you start off with Thomas Edison, who uh, main purpose was to create a source of light that produced white. Uh, the same thing was true of uh, the initial fluorescent tubes. They weren't interested in making colors, they were interested in making white light. So there's a long history of uh, approaching illumination by duplicating uh, the sun or something similar to the sun. What I've done basically is I have broken down the white light into colored elements and recombined them uh, to produce white light in a sequence of events as I discussed with you before so that at uh, the beginning of time, if you will, when you turn the sculpture on, uh, you have the multicolors from the various, various tubes and you have a color study uh, abstract form. So you have the best of, of two worlds there. You've got the, the beauty of the color, That's but you correct. don't have the distortion of the color in your light source. That's correct. Because That's amazing to me. Yeah, well, it, it is a, a very fundamental approach to illuminating space because it really allows you to have the best of both worlds. Uh, bringing art and function uh, together are um, I think a lot of people feel that if you're functional, you can't be art, uh, and vice versa, which is why there's so much design. Design is somewhere halfway between uh, those two positions. Uh, Tell me, Murray, about the educational application of, wh of what you're doing. What, what is your role in that? The educational part of the work is probably the most important part of it um, because that the work is both art and function, you run into the mindsets of uh, people in the art field or people in the design or architectural field. Uh, and they have to break those mindsets uh, so that they can embrace uh, this concept and start to find application for it. So what I've done is that I have been putting on five-hour seminars for architects, interior designers, space planners, uh, illuminating engineers, and uh, people in the art field. Uh, Is that an unusual group of people to have together? Yes, uh, because they all uh, usually are very narrow in their scope. and uh, Stay with their own kind. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, and they they yeah. tend to look at things that way as well. Uh, an illuminating engineer looks at things in terms of functional uh, foot candles, illumination. Uh, an architect uh, tends to look at things in terms of form. A designer tends to look at things in terms of color, a space planner in terms of, of the layout of an environment, and they tend to focus on those things. Yes, they, there is an intercourse between them mm -hmm. because they all collaborate to build a building or, or, or whatever. Um, but uh, it's a collaboration where everybody has their specific roles and there's very, very little spillover. So what I try to accomplish in the seminars is to make them feel the work as opposed to think intellectually about it to get some sort of response, a uh, human response uh, that can begin the catalyst of having them look in more general terms at something that uh, is in a sense revolutionary. Uh, only revolutionary in the sense that uh, that's not the way you do things. <laughs> Murray, uh, that word revolutionary uh, triggered something in my mind. Um, it is that certainly and futuristic what you do, but also it has a tie back to something very ancient in human experience, to a time when man created beautiful utensils, mm -hmm. um, uh, say an Akama pot, um, which is certainly a thing of beauty, but it had a function. So um, what you're doing has some very interesting humanistic ties to 
primitivism. Oh, I, I totally agree, and you're very sensitive to bring that up, because if there is an anathema uh, to my work, it lies in the concept of form following function. Mm -hmm. uh, in ancient times, this wasn't true. Man was much more individual and humanistic. I suppose if you could categorize my work, it would be that function follows art. And mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, those old pots and things uh, uh, were somewhere in between one and the other. But they, uh, the thing that bothers me about so much of contemporary uh, art and design, which is a reflection of the philosophy of our, our society, is that man alone doesn't exist in there. A type of man exists, the guy that drives a BMW and has the Visa Gold Card or other subgroups and so on and so forth, but uh, not the individual. And in all of my work, uh, because it is abstract and philosophically based, uh, its purpose is to make the person that lives in the environment with this work to feel that he's special and unique and not just part of a clique or a, a, uh, a group of people, but rather that part of him exists alone, and this is an expression of, of his peace and aloneness. Murray, let's talk about the very walls as art. Well, walls are two-dimensional forms. Uh, art covers two-dimensional forms, bas-reliefs, uh, and three-dimensional sculptural forms. And there are examples of all those forms in this group called Energy Efficient Art. Uh, walls lend themselves very well to being canvases, uh, especially if you paint uh, them with gesso, the same stuff that you put on uh, a canvas mm -hmm. uh, to treat it. And if you bring that section of the wall out to give it a dignity of its own space, uh, then it's certainly a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, the music responsive piece we just saw uh, is what I consider a bas relief because it uses an acrylic, uh, not an, it uses clear acrylic, uh, uh, cemented in a in a polymerized form, so it can pull out to uh, a very hard material similar to um, I don't know what you call the uh, stuff you make tables with formica. Oh, formica, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, so it's very sturdy. It can mm -hmm. be washed down or, or uh, use compressed air to clean it or somebody mm -hmm. wants to go up there with a uh, uh, Windex and a paper towel <laughs> for 100 years. Did, were you able to, to do that, the piece that, that has these acrylic pieces in um, a single, um, I mean, did you have the concept and then execute it or did you try lots of different things? And uh, Well, I had the, the concept. Uh, what I did was I had to make uh, three paintings because in this uh, a piece there are three light sources so that each piece of acrylic had to make a line or a form in shadow uh, that would work with three different light angles. Now so, I could see you losing your mind hitting those things, yes, making them swing yes, and yes. then testing how that's the, right the it was a step and repeat it took a very long yes, time. Yes I would uh, think so. A long time to do and then the acrylic had to be beveled uh, for polymerized connection over a, a large... Yes, so because there, some pieces are, are at 90 degree angles, but right. many of them are slanted in right. various angles. Right, that's angles. correct. Yeah. yeah, right. But they were, it, was a, it was an abstract black and white graphic, and uh, it was sort of like painting three paintings in the same space, <laughs> which uh, um, mm -hmm. could either increase your mental capacity or send you into or a nervous disorder. <laughs> I can see that. Now, it responds to the, the bass tones in That's music, correct. is that right? Yeah, uh, a narrow range within the bass uh, will sequence the, the lights. Mm -hmm. So uh, it works with all different kinds of music. Mm -hmm. How are we going to affect a collaboration now between all these disciplines and end up with the kind of product you have in mind? Uh, this is why the seminars are so important, because we're in the educational stage of uh, communicating the concept and communicating the concept specifically to the skills of the architect, the interior designer, the space planner, the illuminating engineer. 
and uh, teaching them in, in great detail about things like cost, uh, uh, maintenance, uh, collectability, uh, installation, um, and also the abstract. And uh, through these seminars, uh, teach them to how to use their skills in coming to the, uh, an execution of, of the product or system. Uh, the difference, if there is a difference, between this and a conventional uh, way of building a building or uh, designing interior space is that the architect becomes, and the other professionals, uh, critical collaborators in the process. The art, if you will, energy efficient art, the work is not inviolate, the concept is inviolate. So you can do a variety of shapes and sizes to fit space, whether it's a 200 foot mural connecting two terminals or it's a bar sequence, uh, something over a bar in a, in a uh, in a habitat or environment. Uh, in that sense, it's different. Uh, and it invites those people to complete the art form because we're no longer creating design spaces. We're creating an environmental art form and they're critical to the process. I'm only a catalyst, if you will. And a teacher. <laughs> principle of the work has to do with saving energy in an environment, the living environment, without the loss of human dignity. Uh, the time this was built, this experimental environment, uh, it was built in uh, New York Soho District. Uh, it was a loft reconverted, basically 30 foot square. Uh, were 30 feet by 30 feet. Uh, ceilings were 18 feet high. And uh, there were no walls separating the living area from the dining uh, or the sleeping. Uh, the year was 1976. It was the year of the oil crisis. And uh, the future potential of running out of oil without an alternative cheap energy source and clean, indicated that our industrialized society would be in very bad shape. Uh, a lot of people have dealt with this problem, notably the Japanese, and the way they solve it is to build smaller and smaller environments. Uh, the way I've solved it is to build a very large open environment without walls with a system that uses uh, a minuscule amount of energy. For example, in this environment, uh, normally to heat and cool it from an engineering point of view, you would need equipment rated at 26,000 BTUs. Uh, that's British thermal units. And, and that's an indication of how much energy it takes, isn't That's it? correct. Okay. Uh, this space was cooled and heated in comfort with 8,500 BTUs uh -huh. to give you an idea of the, the savings. And the way the savings were executed is that there is a uh, diffuser that pushes air out and lights that illuminate and sound speakers that give out sound. The difference in this system is that this system literally flies around the room as needed. When you're in the living area here, a console right here uh, energizes electric fans here and here to position the diffuser payload directly over the functional area in use at that time. So you get a saturated air envelope of cool or hot air uh, that makes it very comfortable where you're using the space. The rest of the space is comfortable as well, uh, but the walls now have much less energy than normally, because normally heat comes out from the walls or air conditioning comes out from a window or whatever. By depriving the walls, the ceiling, the floors, or not the floors so much, of energy, you're changing the uh, 
ratio of outside inside temperature uh, and that determines how quickly you lose your energy to the outside. Uh, if it's uh, warm inside and cold outside, hot moves to cold. So if you're able to reduce the wall temperatures by 20 degrees or 30 degrees without affecting uh, your 70 degree inside temperature and it's 20 degrees outside, you've changed the BTU loss ratio, that's the engineering term, by a significant amount. So your rate of flow of energy uh, outside is substantially reduced. Uh, Murray, is this, excuse me, but is this um, operated uh, automatically or no, as it, you move, do you No, move it's, the it's operated manually from a console here, but while you're using the living area, uh, it's positioned there while you're sleeping in the sleeping area, it's positioned there while you're in your dining area, it's positioned here. What happens is that you have your 70 degree comfort zone here, but over here and over here, it's uh, maybe 65 degrees, so you're still in your comfort zone. It's the walls that are being deprived of energy up near the ceiling, all these things so which are far away. everybody in the room has to agree where they're going to be. Yes, everybody uh, has to agree, but uh, that's better than being in a tiny little cubicle where everything that you do, you sleep and you eat yes. and uh, you live in the same very small space. This allows you an open, dignified environment. Right. Um, and I like your uh, allusion to the um, a Japanese concept because even this has some of the Japanese qualities in that the living space serves many functions. That's correct. The older Japanese yeah, idea. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. The bed comes out of a closet at night and goes on the floor and so right, forth. Yeah. Right. So um, does that have a wide degree of, of comfort? I mean, suppose you should have, uh, let's say, uh, an elderly person who requires more heat. Um, well, you set the thermostat totally to whatever adjustable. temperature you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another interesting aspect of the system is unlike a conventional home where you have to worry about pipes that are going to freeze or whatever, you don't have to keep the environment uh, warm while you're away, while it's not in use, because you instantaneously get heat to the area that you want uh, when you come in. Now, how about living with this um, kind of Rube Goldberg-looking thing? Well, it, it <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I realize. Uh, actually, it its ugliness is uh, quite attractive to me personally. <laughs> However, it can be very streamlined uh, as well. You, I, you, you did it, when you did this experiment, you did it so that everybody could see exactly how it's working? Is that... Well, I, I did it because I felt it was a living uh, thing and uh, <laughs> uh, that it was in a sort of a partnership with human beings in the environment and almost like an umbilical cord that was uh, attached. Uh, it's always upset me that uh, heating systems and cooling systems are used to uh, heat walls and furniture and floors instead of basically starting out with what they're supposed to do the is people? the people and the air around them. And this is what this deals with. Another thing that uh, advantage of the system is that uh, by using smaller equipment, uh, the cost of a heating, cooling, air conditioning, uh, I'm sorry, sound system, lighting system, uh, is substantially less. There are no wires running through the walls. There are no ducts running through the walls. There aren't multiple openings. Uh, there aren't uh, a variety of the things that uh, run through uh, our walls. So that this system it, itself that completely treats the space costs less than $2,500 to install, including all the equipment that's Oh, my, and that's the sound as well? That's including the sound system as well, because in the sound system, you buy a relatively small uh, tuner and amplifier because the speakers now are much closer to their intended uh, ah. use, the ear of the person, and uh, uh, so the diff distance between the speaker and the user could be as little as three, three feet, three or four feet, so you don't need the level of mm -hmm. uh, sound uh, that you would, so the equipment is smaller, it's cheaper, it's still the same quality. You get very good mm -hmm. quality. All this system is uh, uses very high quality material. Do you see an application of this? Um, uh, well, obviously you, you would or you wouldn't have worked with it. But in uh, the near future, do you see it uh, wide? Well, I, I, I see it for people who are concerned about uh, energy conservation. 
uh, which would be a relatively limited amount of people, I think, now. But I think that when, in the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to start to see uh, substantial rises in, in oil. I think in the next 50 years, uh, uh, a number of countries, uh, their known reserves will have been extinguished. Or I was just going to say, not to mention yeah. it's complete loss in the That's foreseeable correct. future. That's correct. So mm -hmm. uh, at some point in time, uh, energy conservation uh, is going to be critical and probably even mandated uh, by government where you're rationed. Uh, in the amount of energy you're able to use, and the choices will be, in terms of your living, uh, will be to use uh, an open environment using this type of system, uh, or a very small uh, cubicle. Now we have an entire wall that's not only a piece of art, a static piece of art, but it's moving as well. Uh, the movement uh, in this piece is important because uh, it connects to um, our own body rhythms, if you will. Um, unlike a lot of the other pieces, uh, this is meant to uh, be a very peaceful form uh, where one can sit and contemplate, whether it's in a habitat or connecting uh, two terminals in an airport. The same principles apply. The multicolored light recombines the spectrum and uh, puts white light into the environment. Uh, the difference uh, here in this the technology here is basically um, a long box that's near the ceiling that has uh, maybe seven or eight neon tubes in it. Uh, white light is made from those tubes and then a series of louvers turn around to make white light minus this and minus that. So you end up, instead of having eight colors, you end up with maybe a hundred uh, different colors as it goes through its cycle. And you could have more or less louvers too, couldn't you? You that could have more or less have... louvers, you can control the speed of it, you can make the color changes responsive, responsive to a heartbeat or to uh, your breath, uh, you can make it responsive to music. It's very, very much connected to you and uh, sitting in it after a long day at the office uh, becomes, or if in fact it's at your office, you know, <laughs> right. uh, makes for a much more peaceful, uh, relaxed uh, situation. In fact, uh, we had talked to some uh, medical people about some psychiatric uh, possibilities for it, using it in maybe a sanitarium for uh, mentally ill people as a relaxing uh, form, but it's just in the talking stages uh, at this point. Well, what I like mostly, though, is that it's just perfectly beautiful to look at. Well, it's thank you very really much. It's really gorgeous to look at. It's like a sunset in another planet. processes Murray uses in his art fixtures involves evaporating silver or gold in a vacuum chamber. The metal turns first to liquid, then to gas, and finally back to its solid form almost instantaneously. He is able to apply gold or silver a millionth of an inch thick to glass. The gold contact lenses made this way are functional sunglasses. You've mentioned there's an application of your lighting technology to horse breeding. There are systems now called photoperiod systems that are used in uh, breeding barns to uh, make horses, to fool horses to think that uh, May or June is really in uh, January or February. <laughs> And the reason for that is uh, that horses are categorized by the year in which they're born. A yearling that's normally born in June will not run as fast as a five-month-old older yearling born in January. Uh, the photoperiod lighting systems are basically just different kinds of light bulbs that are kept on in the barn for longer periods in different parts of the year to stimulate fur lustrous. There's a certain amount of uh, success uh, in that program, maybe 50% successful. Uh, what we bring to the table is that not only can we make the lights longer in the barn, we can duplicate the exact chromatic composition of sunlight uh, in springtime when breeding occurs, and we feel that's an important 
part of the retinal trigger and that we should be able to boost uh, January births uh, substantially. Uh, that's the horse breeding program. It's a similar situation for breeding of endangered species. Certain macaw birds from the Amazon jungle don't do very well in captivity. We intend to bring their light specifically morning to dusk their breeding season into the uh, zoo itself so they're more comfortable and uh, happier and uh, they uh, will breed better and faster because we're making white light from colors and because we can individually control the intensity of each of the colors we can uh, deliver a variety of white lights for example with a, a flick of a switch you can have incandescent type of light another switch you can have fluorescent light another switch you can have uh, north light another switch you can have uh, a program of morning uh, into dusk uh, from uh, some part of brazil in their summertime uh, uh, or an amazon jungle you can have light from uh, kilimanjaro's peak in uh, november uh, seriously you can exactly reproduce chromatic composition and the mood uh, is uh, the ability to change the mood in an environment from the nature of the white light that you deliver is absolutely astounding. Emotionally, you feel much different. For example, uh, you very infrequently see fluorescent tubes over a dining room table. The reason for that is that the light that they give out has a lot of blue, which is not a soft ambient kind of light to eat by. It's a light to type by or uh, to do functional things by, but not to feel relaxed with. That sort of gives you an idea of uh, the power of light. We've carried that power to uh, the nth degree, and we can manipulate it and control it. So what we represent here with this work, essentially, is we're moving from a dimming situation into a much greater range of mood control for an environment. And uh, that's the promise of this work. Thanks for joining us today on a visit to the exciting creative world of Murray Toby. I'm Mary Jane Rust. Watch Emphasis on Arts every week right here on TV 13.